Okay, so uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Velasquez, for this uh, very wonderful introduction. So first of all, I uh, would like to thank the EDNU administration, especially the uh, Heritage Committee, for giving this opportunity to uh, for me to be able to share to you for some of the very uh, important highlights about the early years of National University and as well as the uh, and as well as the a short or some of the short stories about the founder Don Mariano Fortunato Hoxon and how he was able to establish what we know as the first non sectarian So here, uh, the coverage of my presentation here is the, uh, of course, the early years again of uh, of NU, and uh, of course uh, when the, at the time when the founder was born, and up to the time before it was known as National University. It's very important for for us, just like what Sir Nilo told us to to walk back through time and know more about uh, what happened during those years. So at first, the uh, okay, next slide. So it's very important for us in every educational institution to learn some of the highlights or the context as to how NU was established. Since the founder was born in the late 19th century, there were already a lot of educational highlights that happened during that time. Some of those was that a school of mercantile accounting and modern languages was patterned after the commercial school of Barcelona was established on July 15, 1840. It offered accounting and mercantile correspondence, mathematics, French, English, and other subjects. This, sub, this course is considered at that time as one of the most prestigious programs or non-baccalaureate programs, especially at the late 1800s. Because uh, once you are able to, to finish this program, you'd be a, you have the know-how to establish your own business. And uh, it was offered by premier schools in Manila. So when we say premier, it is uh, those are the ones just like, uh, of course, Ateneo Municipal de Manila, the University of Santo Tomas, Cole and uh, Coleo San Juan de Letran. And uh, at that time, it became the basis of the program that our founder took in the Ateneo Municipal, which is Perito Mercantil, which. Uh, I'll be elaborating in a while. And then on, uh, in 1863, there was also a royal decree that was uh, issued for a standard primary educational system. Because uh, at that time, take note that, uh, or prior to that time, the primary educational system was only based on the uh, on the parochial schools. Okay, so in the parochial schools, wherein uh, it, the friars were the ones providing the necessary instruction. But since then, when we had the, the Royal Decree of 1863, you had the, what we call the, uh, you have the elementary, the system or the standardized um, elementary system, wherein we had this uh, the system where in all provinces in the Philippines would be able to have a standard system. Okay, so uh, and then two years later, in 1865, Queen Isabella II appoint, appointed the rector of the University of Santo Tomas as the supervisor of all secondary and higher educate higher educational institutions in the Philippines. So here, um, 
those who wishes to to take their <clears throat> their education in Manila would be under the supervision of UST. So UST it was considered at that time as equivalent to today's Commission on Higher Education and the Department of Education, wherein uh, they hold the they held the entrance and final examinations for all those who wish to enter secondary and higher education and those who have finished their courses. And likewise, uh, they also issue the diplomas of the graduates regardless of where they took their courses. So they're the ones who, so they were everything because uh, remember during those times, uh, they, we were still, remember, we were still under the principle of the Union of Church and State Principle. So in, in that case, we have uh, the, the, this practice as to how uh, we'll see the, some of the documents related to our founder wherein how these things transpired. Because at that time, if you're able to take units of education in Manila, in the, uh, in the normal school, you'd be able to establish your own schools in the province. That was uh, that was the norm during that time. That's why. Um, so uh, these are just uh, some of those things. Okay, next. Then another thing that uh, we would like to highlight here is the the impact of the Chinese immigration. So we um, the Chinese mestizos rose to prominence between seven. 1741 and 1898, primarily as a landholder and a middleman wholesaler for local produce and foreign imports, although there was there were also mestizos in the professions. So here, um, the, Chinese, the Chinese immigration was very important uh, at that time because uh, the, the Chinese were the ones whom the, the government officials of the Spaniards uh, relied upon to when it comes to business. And uh, culturally speaking, they influenced a lot, especially on, on the, not only the business sector, but also somehow in the political sector. And so it, uh, the, the business emerged because um, the, uh, the Chinese immigrants were very business oriented they're very skillful and uh, so they're the ones that uh, the government the authorities relied upon too okay so um, a lot of them were were situated in the parian district so today it is uh, located in the present day escolta and in jones bridge so nandiyan yung ano eh yung mga yung mga changi noon no so they do their commerce at, at those times, you know? so and then, uh, but before they were able be able to do that, uh, these Chinese need to be baptized in order to stay in the islands and do business. So that's why. Uh, so how do they do that? So first, the Spanish officials and friars stood as godparents. Okay, so here. Uh, their surname. So, since they had to be baptized as a taking the surnames of their godparents. So, bagay mga ninong uh, yun yung kinukuha nilang apelido kasi they had to to adopt a Spanish surname at that time. While some others they retained their father's surname, while others used their mother's maiden surname so it also depends on the setup so there are some uh, situations wherein they were they were able to, to do so why is that very important because uh, remember that uh, in history the, the Chinese were the ones who printed the first uh, or opened the first printing press in the Philippines and uh, you know by the name of uh, Thomas Pinpin and uh, also, we have to know why is this very important. Uh, some of you might be wondering, uh, why is this 
overview very important to our founder because uh, our founder also had Chinese ancestry and uh, this is how we are going to uh, I'm going to tell you why because uh, with this work ethic we could actually um, compare this to the 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 atypical uh, work ethic of uh, a Chinese businessman okay so next so here, what I what we have here is the lineage or the ancestry of our founder. Okay, so his grandfather Thomas Hoxon originally with the name Hoxung from Amoy, China, the province of China. So a lot of them migrated in the 1700s. So they so uh, based on accounts, Thomas Hoxon migrated to the Philippines and he married Juana Francisca de los Reyes and uh, of course they had one of their offsprings Feliciano Hoxon so remember that uh, in order to for their name to be Hispanized uh, the spelling changed so that's why you have there the Hoxon without an H and then Feliciano Hoxon married Florentina Velasco and uh, they had a son named Remigio Hoxon, who later on married Marta Papa. Then, of course, Marta Papa uh, and Remigio uh, had one of their children by the name of Chris Pulo, who later on married Marcela Allegrado. And, of course, uh, because in other sources, it was named Cruz or De La Cruz. No? So there are some... Uh, concerns about it, but nonetheless, uh, it uh, Marcela was the mother of our founder Mariano Fortunato Hoxon. Okay, so but first, let's take a look first at his father, Chris Pulo. Okay, so as we take a look here. Chris Polo Hoxon was born in Manila on June 9, 1850 and became a sculptor and, and a woodcarver of, of note. Take note at that time also when uh, when Chris when Chris Polo Hoxon became a woodcarver. Take note that uh, wood carving was one of uh, a, one of the most lucrative professions um, at that time because uh, since at that period, we have also the rise of the middle class and uh, wood carving was considered as a middle class uh, profession and of course it's also an art. Okay? Although you must be creative at your own craft if you are a wood carver at that time. So he was credited with the M image of the La Immaculada Concepcion or the Immaculate Conception and with the carving of the pulpit together with a man named Manuel Flores. Um, at that time, if you're commissioned by a church or a cathedral to, to do their, for example, the altar, the pulpit, the images, um, it would provide you with a, uh, it will provide you more than enough. If, uh, if you're commissioned to do all the sculptures of a certain church. So that was how uh, Chris Pulo uh, lived. No? That was his uh, specialization in wood carving. But he also do other things like uh, wooden toys um, and wooden other structures. So kung baga mga commission, no? kung baga kasi in wood carving, one, one important thing that you have to, to consider is that if if you are, kumbaga, nagandahan yung mga tao, no? if uh, your clients were pleased of what you you did, um, they it would be word of mouth that will recommend you to other clients at that time. Even even today, no? it, uh, the word of mouth still works. Okay? So he was awarded an honorable mention by the Ministry of the Ultramar or the Ministry of the Colonies. So the Ministry of the Colonies was the one that, con the, that 
handled or where the Philippines was under control in the latter parts of the Spanish colonial era. Okay, so for his entries in the Exposition General de las Islas Filipinas or the General Exposition of the Philippine Islands. So when you say exposition, it's like an, uh, a painting exhibit uh, in Madrid in October of 1887 and uh, by the jurado or the jury, the International Jury of Prices. Okay, so since uh, if you are granted an award, at least an honorable mention, if you were not in the first prize, it's not bad because, uh, of course, there were cash prizes at that time wherein he was, you know, talagang dun sila nag, uh, humahataw, no? yung mga sculptors, yung mga artists, should I say. No? Not only sculptors, but, o but also painters. So, so yun yung ano nila, that, uh, that is actually their bread and butter. And uh, also, uh, Chris Polo also works in the Ateneo Municipal de Manila no, uh, at the same time. Okay, so, ayan, so he married uh, Marcela Legrado on February 9, 1875, and uh, Mariano Fortunato, their third son or child brother, was born on October 14, uh, 1877 in Santa Cruz, Manila. So no wonder that uh, we're having this webinar at the birth month of none of, uh, of our very own founder. Okay, so next. Yeah, so since he's a wood carver, so let me just show you uh, this piece of wood carving of Chris Polo Hoxon. So this was later on given by Chris Polo to his son in appreciation. So it was uh, medio fast forward there, you know, in 1903 in appreciation for the establishment of your Colegio Filipino. So so it has a lot of symbolisms because, uh, sad, uh, I mean, of course, uh, Hopefully, if we would be able to have a, uh, a, a, at least a souvenir, I mean, this is just a, one of the remaining pictures of that uh, sculpture, of uh, the very own sculptures of uh, Chris Pulo Hoxon. And uh, later on, it was uh, taken from our logos, so the, the university logos. Uh, so first, uh, of course, you have the symbolism here. Uh, you have the Mother Philippines. Then you also have uh, at the background, the, the background of the Philippine flag. And then you also have there the globe, uh, which symbolizes arts. And then uh, you have books underneath, uh, symbolizing letters. And uh, at, the, at the corner, the left corner, you have the Cadocius as the symbol of science. Of course, we know the Cadocius as the symbol of medicine. So no wonder that uh, later on, uh, NU, the the brainchild of our founder, the creation, the establishment of our founder, would be able to evolve in all these things that uh, that that has been symbolized by this wood carving of uh, of Chris Polo Hoxon. Okay, next. Okay, so here, uh, of course, um, again, Mariano Fortunato Hoxon was born in October 14, 1877. Uh, so you have here Atoy, as he was uh, fondly called by even his uh, relatives, even his uh, descendants. He, he's called as Lolo Atoy. No? So he learned from his father, the value of honest work. So as we could see, he was a, a very studious man because the Hoxons were, well, they're, uh, they're not that we could say poor, but they are not also rich. So they are only in the middle, uh, we could classify them in the middle class of the society at that time. Because uh, of course, uh, the founder was able to to enter in a uh, prestigious school, but how? So that would, uh, we would know. So if you notice in this picture, uh, look how he was, uh, how, how uh, industrious he, he is 
he was diligent, especially in his studies. And so he was uh, already trained at a very young age to uh, to be productive. Okay, next. Okay, so here uh, he was again. He was able to study at the Ateneo Municipal de Manila in Intramuros, despite his father's modest means, in exchange for his work for the Jesuits. Because uh, at that time, when when he entered, no, so again, uh, kung yung aral ni founder dito, it's uh, kung baga agreement between the Jesuits. Na kasi siempre ma nag-aaral yung ano ni, eh, nagtatabaho si Chris Polo sa Ateneo. So, in return, yung anak niya was able to enter hmm, uh, almost for free, you know, if not totally for free. Okay, so, and at that time, take note, um, Ateneo evolved from, kasi they started as a charity school of Manila. So, it was Escuela Pia, and then uh, before the return of the Jesuits, because the Jesuits were expelled in 1768, then they returned in 1859, and then it renamed the school, the Escuela Pia, to Ateneo Municipal de Manila. So at that time, uh, as a young student at the Ateneo, Atoy or Mariano already displayed his practical nature and spirit of entrepreneurship. So he was already a business-minded person and he even sold toys like yo-yo uh, being carved in his father's shop to earn him money to buy books and paper so so he bought uh, school supplies uh, at that time no? so he was uh, ano talagang ano siya maabilidad masasabi natin and uh, later on he had himself tutored uh, in advanced accounting by a frenchman named uh, Operel who became so impressed that uh, the student became, uh, secured a future position as librarian at the Bazar Filipino, which he held at until the outbreak of the Philippine Revolution. So of course he was, uh, he was a burly individual. He was he had a big physique, uh, yeah, six feet tall. Okay, so. So nonetheless, but it doesn't stop him from doing, you know, he was very confident of, of, of what he does. Okay, so he later on, eventually, he received this degree of Bachelor in Artes and a certificate as Perito Mercantil. So it, uh, the, name, the term Perito means expert, so business, so it's, it literally means expert in business, so it is uh, equivalent to our today's Business Administration courses okay, in 18 uh, in 1897 with a grade of approbado or pass. Okay, so here is the what uh, I'm talking about a while ago. So we have the the third uh, the thing here. Um, Real y Pontificia Universidad de Santo Tomas de Manila or Real Royal and Pontifical um, we, of course, I uh, have the letterhead of uh, of UST at that time. So, año or year of 1897, and uh, we have here the name Mariano Hoxon E. Cruz. Okay, so we have the profile here. So, again, uh, that's the reason why um, the diploma of our founder is uh, spelled uh, like this. Okay, so again, so uh, of course, um, I was able to look at this uh, or was able to retrieve this at the uh, at the USD archives early this Janu um, this early January um, before the before the pandemic. So good enough that uh, uh, we're able to to retrieve this from uh, from the archives. Okay, next. So here, let's uh, try to take a look a bit at the uh, academic record of, uh, of the founder of Hoxon in Ateneo. So these are just some of the programs or the subjects that he took. Okay, so actually if you compare this nowadays, it's somehow comparable to, to the ABM 
program in in uh, in senior high no some probably or some are considered as major subjects in your business administration courses and uh, if you notice the grading system during that time it's not yet numerical it, it is by means of words okay so it depends on how you pass the examination so so just like the subjects, so you have here arithmetic and algebra. So I already translated it in English, the equivalent. Okay, so elements of geography. You have uh, you have a uh, French uh, and then English. Then we also have a uh, business math and uh, yeah, notions of geography and business statistics. Okay, political economics, uh, bookkeeping business correspondence and operations and lastly you have mercantile or business law so if we take a look at his uh, grading of course he was neither an honor student but nor he got a failing grade so what does this tell us that even his grades he was uh, he was proud enough it's uh, of course it's he graduated in convincing fashion because with these uh, grades, or if I say the units that Mariano Hoxon took in Perito Mercantil, we could say that he was um, prepared, he was totally prepared in his eventual quest to establish his institution. Okay, so he had the know-how of business and also of education because he had the he had units in French and English. Okay, knowing that uh, later on, three years, uh, three years later after he graduated, you know, when upon the arrival of the Americans, it would be English would be the medium of instruction in terms of classroom education. Okay, next. Yeah, okay, so uh, okay, so let me just uh, have the some of his uh, traits. So he was actually an avid horse racer. Okay, so and also a golfer. So he also practiced golf at Wak Wak okay, as his pastime. Okay, so talagang ano siya, eh, kumbaga, he had a sort of a work life balance. No? So he, he doesn't. Uh, he did not forget how to enjoy despite the rigorous uh, times or the rigorous hours of training, of teaching, of managing his own school. Talagang na ano niya yun eh. Masasabi natin he was, uh, he, he was able to, to balance everything. And one thing also to remember with the, with the founder himself was that ano siya eh, yung makatao no when he established the school uh kumbaga pantay-pantay yung pagtingin niya sa mga tao no the way he look at the big people kasi he was able to meet uh the high people in the society he was able to do that also with the ordinary people okay? so wala siyang ano wala siyang pinipili i mean iba pantay-pantay hindi siya Kumbaga, totoo siyang tao. So, that's how he was best described by his peers. Okay, next. So, during the revolution, he also became a school teacher in Marikina. Although, he yeah, he did not join the armed struggle. Kasi he knew that uh, in order for the country to progress, we need more of education than of revolution. Although, some of his other relatives did join the revolution. So one of his uh, cousins, one of the prominent ones was uh, Feliciano Hoxon, who was a pharmacist who owned a drugstore in Escolta, who also became a catiponero and uh, a secretary of welfare. No? Take note, uh, he was appointed by his cousin, yeah, the one in the picture, was Feliciano Hoxon, no? cousin of uh, Mariano. Who, who changed their names ano? so to Hoxon. Eh, kasi ang nangyari sa kanila uh, because of those uh, 
things. They changed, like, especially in the American, Filipino-American war, they added an H. Yeah, it was the time that they added an H to the Hoxon spelling to avoid being identified, no? para hindi sila mahuli ng mga authorities. Okay, so another one, another cousin, Fortunato, joined the guerrillas during the Filipino-American War. So you have uh, Feliciano, kasi si Feliciano kasi maagang namatay. Okay, and then si Fortunato, yan, kaya yung, if you notice, uh, yung dalawa yung kalsada ng NU, so of course, the one, uh, yung isa, M.F. Hoxon, and then yung isa, yung F. Hoxon. So, F. Hoxon, the one facing, uh, yung going to Lacson, adjacent to Lacson and the uh, Earnshaw, it is named after Fortunato. Okay, so that's, uh, that is uh, the one that, uh, that took. Okay, so another, so they, they were the ones who, the Hoxons who were revolutionaries. No, kaya makikita nyo may, uh, if you see this one, uh, the Hoxons have some resemblances to our foremost heroes like uh, uh, Jose Rizal. Okay, so so we actually could compare uh, Mariano Hoxon to Rizal later on. And then the other two Hoxons to the likes of uh, Andres Bonifacio or uh, Emilio Aguinaldo because they, they were the revolutionaries. Okay, so they have their own brand of nationalism in other words. Okay, next. Yeah, so here, uh, I just, uh, as for Feliciano Hoxon, yeah, si Feliciano Hoxon kasi after, yun nga, masa, medyo masa, nakakalungkot kasi um, one of Hoxon's kasi, yeah, si Feliciano, was uh, was argued to be the uh, the designer of the national flag. But uh, of course, everyone of us know that um, Aguinaldo, was the one who asked to have the Philippine flag designed. But in one account of, uh, of Julio Nakpil, okay, so Julio Nakpil, sino ba siya? Siya yung uh, pangalawang asawa ni Gregorio de Jesus, yung asawa ni Andres Bonifacio. So according to the account of Julio Nakpil, of course this is until today, it is uh, being argued upon by historians up until now. But uh, one argument, na sinasabi yan, bukod dun sa account ni Julio Nakpil that uh, in this document that that we have here, yan, we have the flag here and then the one encircled by red was the write-up of Julio Nakpil that saying that Feliciano Hoxon was the one that designed the, the flag. And another argument that uh, that could be put here was that uh, that narrative was that uh, since Hoxon, Feliciano Hoxon graduated from UST, the inspiration of the sun, kasi the symbol was uh, progress and civilization. Okay, so the inspiration here was the chess symbol in Saint Thomas of Saint Thomas Aquinas, which was later on adopted by the South American countries, ano? so like Argentina and Uruguay, because uh, they they saw that Aquinas was called the angelic doctor because of his reputation of learning and wisdom. And since uh, the progress of civilization was actually um, compared or it meant progress in education. So somehow there are some uh, connections between these symbolisms that we could uh, actually connect with the uh, with the founder himself. So we could say that the Hoxon family is actually uh, nationalistic. Talaga makabayan sila na masasabi. Okay, next. So, of course, let's take a look at uh, the personal life of uh, Mariano. So he first married his uh, first wife, Consuelo Luciano from Cavite in 1901. So they had two children. You have Domingo and Ramon. Okay, so Domingo eventually became the first or became the longest president of National University, especially after the war. Okay, so siyempre, um, so it will be discussed in the, in the next webinar. Okay, then, um, so 
So, ito yung kanya unang, ano, no? So, this was the first marriage. So, Consuelo died in uh, 1908. Next. So, we have Mariano, the second wife, of course, si Doña Miguela. Si Doña Miguela Martin, whom he had uh, eight children. Okay, so, so, iba dito, yan, no? Si, you have Lorenza, you have uh, Recaredo, Remedios, um, Leticia, Teodoro, Jesus, Mariano, and uh, Pasita. Okay, so, si Jesus is the, Jesus served also as president of NU. And uh, actually, a lot of the, uh, most of his, of their children, of Doña Miguela, served in various capacities in NU, especially after the war. Yun yung yun, mal malalaman natin in a, in a while. Okay, next. Yeah, so, okay, Doña Miguela Martin Viuda de Hoxon. Yeah, but because it, uh, that's how it was spelled at that time. Kasi medyo maagang na Viuda si, uh, si Doña Miguela, no, 1928. Can you imagine that? No? So, he took, she took over as the Ennius controller after Mariano's death in, in 1928, wherein she inculcated her children the values of respect for authority and deep religious faith. Napaka-importante yung lalo na yung pagsisimba. Okay, so, kumbaga, uh, the Hoxon family was re um, raised as a devout Catholic. And uh, unfortunately, they closed NU during the Japanese occupation and later on opened in 19. 45. Okay, so he, she assigned her children to serve in various capacities in the NU administration. So, ang ginagawa kasi nila noon is, uh, aside from that, talagang ano sila, they adopt uh, scholars to become, to serve in their household. Yan. So, yung mga anak nila, may kanya-kanya rin mga yaya. May mga kanya-kanyang kasambahay. Um, and then, after they graduate, palit na naman. No, palit ng palit, kumbaga may transition. Diba? Kasi, biruin mo, can you imagine that? Uh, yung boarding lodging mo, libre lahat and, uh, and all. No? All you have to do is to serve the family. And uh, when you graduate, uh, they eventually have, uh, kumbaga magaganda mga buhay. So that's how they were raised. No? They, the scholars were treated the same as family. So that's very how familial the the Hoxon swear. Okay, up until now, I could I could say that because when we did the interviews with, with the Hoxon relatives, yun ang masasabi nila sa kanilang lola. No, they were trained, talagang tinuruan sila sa nang maayos sa pagpapalakad ng school and at the same time how to treat people right. Kaya yung mga employees noon uh, tumatagal tumatagal sa institution regardless of what situation NU had. Okay, so that's uh, their legacy. That's how their legacy was about. Okay, next. Ayan. So just want to highlight, although marami silang anak, pero I just highlighted one of their children, si Recaredo, Recaredo Danding Hoxon, because uh, uh, Recaredo Hoxon joined as a guerrilla jo uh, during the Japanese occupation. So just like any other guerrilla that was captured, he was incarcerated and tortured at Fort Santiago. But later on, he served as University Registrar of NU. This is just to prove to everyone how uh, nationalistic, paano lumalaban uh, or paano naging makabayan ang lahi ng mga Hoxon. And should, I should say, talagang masasabi natin na uh, they did what is best for the, for the country. No, at, at all costs. Yeah. So, ilang generations yun ng, uh, ng mga Hoxon na who had nationalistic fervor. Okay, next. Yeah, so this is uh, the family portrait of, uh, ayan, uh, of the Hoxon. Sayang nga lang, hindi na nila inabot yung kanilang tatay. So, doon yung Ligeles sa uh, center. So, I think Domingo is at the Yan, at, at the left of Don, uh, Don Miguel, so you have Domingo. And then the one uh, 
at the yung sa gilid this uh, pasita yeah so this is the or pasita is the actually the mother of uh, yeah of Sir Nilo yeah so he, they married the uh, Ocampo uh, Benigno Ocampo and uh, yeah so they are the ones who later on had uh, the served National University okay their eldest son Teodoro Sir Teddy was the former president hmm then you also have Jesus uh, at the middle at the at the center middle who became the president eventual president of NU so Domingo and uh, Jesus Magkasunod Dian next so another picture so ito naman yung buong angkan ng mga Hoxon okay so if you look at their the children and their grandchildren so makikita natin gaano kalaki yung kanilang pamilya so can you just imagine bawat anak ni founder may yun nga yung mga pinapaaral nila no may kanya-kanya silang pinapaaral so <clears throat> pag nakita natin to ilan yung kanila inaalagaan and uh, they live they happy family at that time so this picture i think was taken from the old main building you have the portrait of the founder on top no? kaya masasabi natin talagang napakalaki at uh, talagang napakasaya ng kanilang uh, ng kanilang pamilya yun ang no, if, we, if we describe them okay next yeah. so he succumbed no, to illness so he died on march uh, 17 1928 so he was uh, he was actually at the peak of his career no so it was the only time when NU did not have its graduation rights no so yun lang nakakalungkot doon kasi um when he started NU syempre nagkumpisa siya sa from the uh, you know from the bottom but uh, he started from scratch actually okay and on his last days uh his family Mariano and joined by his wife Miguela and eldest son Domingo to continue the task that he dedicated his life that of uh, which is to educate young men and women of his country. Yan kaya makikita natin ano yung buhay ni founder uh, even though he 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 lived uh, quite short but he contributed a lot kaya nga sabi ng kaibigan niya ng mga kaibigan niya that's Yeah. So one of the one of his closest friends in the academy, si Rafael Palma, who who was the president of UP. Yeah. Kaya nga Palma ko yun tawag don si Rafael Palma in honor of Rafael Palma. He described um, Don Mariano as an untiring worker. Sabi dito. No? So this is the the speech of uh, or the eulogy of Rafael Palma. Kasi the medium at that time was Spanish. Untiring worker who always had plans for the expansion of NU. As a whole but prudent man whose moves were calculated and goals well defined, a man with a firm and energetic disposition and a generous and appealing personality. He chose the field of education because that was where he could serve the greatest number and spread the greatest good, convinced that education was the means for a people to realize their aspirations. And uh, can you imagine and that uh, from a friend who was a uh, university president at that time? Okay, so, kasi talagang nani yun eh, uh, sabi nga natin, the presidents, the owners of the school have strong linkages, especially at the early times. At uh, hindi natin may tatanggi yung talagang dedikasyon ni, uh, ni Mariano. Okay, so, yeah, next. Okay, so now let's uh, ab now let's take a look at the establishment of uh, of National University. So in this picture, uh, this is the <coughs> the old <coughs> main building of NU. So we have here the main building, and then he, we have beside it is the uh, the old elementary building, and then across I think we're familiar here. This was the science building. Which was known to some, to many as the old dentistry building, and is soon to be, I think, uh, the administrative building, 
will be transferred there. And uh, that's why we call it the Heritage Building. So hopefully, uh, uh, actually, it's the oldest existing building of MU no? from 1928. Actually, we could already declare it as a Heritage Building. No? So, so it stood, uh, of course, the Second World War up until the present. No? So that's how, uh, how long this university is. Now, if you could imagine. Okay, next. Yeah, so when any was established, the Kolei uh, Filipino is established in 1900, it, we were still in, in a war with the Americans. And uh, of course, we know in history, Emilio Aguinaldo transferred this government from one place to another. While, while the revolution is ongoing, <clears throat> the Ilustrados, were also part of the Malolos Congress of for American statehood. Uh, and the Partido Federal would be formed before the war is over. Okay, so, kaya masasabi nga natin, hati rin yung mga Pilipino noon. Kasi yung iba, mas pabor na masakop na lang tayo ng Amerikano kasi mas ma pakiram, uh, pa sa kanilang palagay, mas maayos. Okay? And uh, yeah, the war against the Americans would not end until the surrender of General Miguel Malvar in 1902 in Lipa, Batangas, but within Manila. Okay, so within the, uh, kasi during that time, Manila was already under the control of the Americans. So as for the Hawks, uh, as for Mariano, he find it uh, timing that the, it is a high time for him to, to establish a school now, instead of uh, joining the war just like what his relatives did no eh yun nga ma mamamatay ka lang no yun yung palagay yun yung uh, posibleng palagay ng uh, ni Mariano na mas maigi true na lang mga tao na ito na eh mahirap nang uh, banggain yung bagong uh, mananakop so let's just educate the youth especially in the how in the in the way that it is uh, it should be under the new colonizer especially that you already have a civilian government no? yeah. okay next so now let's take a look uh, briefly at the colonial policies of the americans because uh, with act 74 yan passed on January 21, 1901, so ito yung brain, um, so if we take a look at that time, it was led by Dr. David Barrows, so it, it was, it, it was the one that provided for the partitioning of the islands into 10 school divisions. So first, the opening of primary schools in every municipality, no? so an optional religious instruction because that time, uh, we were already shifting from the union of church and state to the separation of church and state principle no? and the use of uh, English as medium of instruction. So transition, kumbaga transitionary yung ginawang policy ng mga Amerikano. So in the case of, of Mariano, pinapattern niya, nilelebel niya dun sa kung ano yung gusto ng, ng America at that time. No? So it what was uh, yeah, sharp distinction between the primary and intermediate courses. Okay, so may mga examinations. No, so you have uniform examination and promotions above also the third grade. The next is uh, elementary education was this time consisted of seven grades. Okay, so the coursework for each level put heavy emphasis on the English grammar, yan, writing, reading, and arithmetic. So all other subjects like drawing, music, Geography, hygiene, and uh, sanitation, history, biology was also added. No? So while the students move up, so they expanded the course offerings because uh, that was how they teach it also in America. So, simply pa pattern nila sa dito sa Philippines. Okay, next. Yeah, and then 1910, so in this picture, you have the typical classroom system. Uh, so in 1910, the new curricular programs were introduced at the intermediate level. Kasi ito yung time na 
Uh, kaya masasabi natin, yung senior high system natin, hindi na po siya bago. Kasi during the time of the Americans, we already have almost the same practice. No? that the, There were special programs designed so that students who did not decide to pursue higher education could be economically productive at once. No, So those are what you call vocational courses. Yan, kasi di ba meron po tayong tech box trend ngayon sa K-12. So, meron na rin noon, kahit nung hindi pa K-12 ang tawag. Okay, so, ayan. So, just take a look at the subjects, no? So, teaching, farming, trade. Actually, during that time, let me tell you also that kung hindi ka, if you were able to fin finish at the second year in high school, you'd be able to teach in the primary schools. Pwede ka na maging teacher, at least if you finish second year high school. No? So, kasi talagang ang, in, in, their emphasis was, at that time was the English language. So, when it was established, sabi dito, um, the education officials saw the urgent need for a state-run university. Okay, so para, yan, so that the promising graduates would have place to continue their secular education. That's why, uh, yan, yung UP, that's why it was established in 1908, tama, 1908. And then there were also the other secular schools. So, kumbaga, unti-unting dumadami ang competition ng NU. So, they really have to innovate at some sort. Okay, next. Yan. So, punta na po tayo sa establishment ng, ng NU. So, yan. Colegio Filipino. Okay. So, 1900. So, if we take a look at 1900, August 1, we are very familiar with that. National yan. So, no? so he was... Um, 23 years old when Don Atoy, Don Mariano, uh, took this sabi nila, proverbial step of establishing no, through his house, yung bahay nila, so actually it was a rented house or an accessoria, or an accessoria means an apartment, no, at Calle Siete at Palma Street in Quiapo. So it was where he first taught, no, so take note, he, he he was the teacher, he was a uh, the janitor, the cashier, the controller, all at once. So he was an all-around man when he established his Coleo Filipino. Bakit pangalan Coleo Filipino? So, because it was the first um, institution, big institution, established by a Filipino. Kasi matatandaan natin, during the time of the Spaniards, uh, most of the the uh, institutions, especially in Manila, the universities, the colleges, were, were founded, owned by the religious orders, like the Jesuits, the Dominicans, and the Agustinians. No? And then, uh, so, tingnan nyo, parang siya nagumpisa, no? Only one classroom and office, and then, every year, pag dumadami enrollment, they added uh, one classroom at a time. No? So, tingnan, the Filipino ang nag- tatag, kaya tinawag na Coleo Filipino. So, at that time, it was the time that Coleo was known to be a college. Kasi dati, ang Coleo noon, uh, educational institution, but it's more of a dormitory for college, uh, for educational instruction. But this but this time, uh, college, yan, uh, the, the word Coleo was situated to be the basis of our college today for, uh, for school. <clears throat> Okay, so 1901, the school rented four rooms at Calle Noria, or known as P. Paterno now, in Quiapo. So yung nasa taas, yun yung sa Calle Palma, and then yung nasa baba in your picture is Calle Noria. So syempre, kailangan mong uh, lumipat at mag-expand. So gradual, gradual yung pag-expand ni, ni Mariano. Next. Hmm. Yeah. So, at the beginning of 1902, uh, it moved to 151 Calle Arlegi in Quiapo. Alam natin ito, malapit sa Malacanang. Ano? So, it had five classrooms and two additional rooms. So, if we take a look at, if we take a look at this one, uh, you have the, uh, you know, so they rented the additional rooms. And later on, uh, kasi tumas yung renta, so they moved to Gastambide in Sampaloc. 
where it was renamed in 1906. Okay, so dito nag-offer na sila, they offer uh, nine classrooms ano, and more spaces where they offered primary, intermediate, and secondary basic education. Because at the first one, yung mga una, primary pa lang kasi in-offer nila, and then later on, they they, uh, they offered the uh, intermediate and secondary levels. And uh, the teachers were uh, actually students preparing for higher education at USP. So in exchange uh, at their services, they were given free board and lodging. No? So, hindi, kumbaga more on allowance, hindi talaga sweldo. Kasi, ano eh, can you imagine that, ano? Yung mga teachers, kasi at that time, yun nga, hindi pa ganun kahigpit sa ang mga ang mga official sa mga authorities at that time. So, uh, that's uh, the reason why uh, the setup was uh, was like that. Okay, next. Then, uh, it later on uh, evolved into, of course, Coleo Mercantil from 1904 to 1915. No? So, uh, kasi it evolved to Coleo Mercantil kasi noon ang nakalaban, uh, natin nakalaban, but uh, the the competition of NU of Kulay Mercantil during that time was the public school system of 1902, which has almost the same curriculum because uh, because of the public school system, sempre mas libre yun, mas maraming papasok doon. So to respond to that particular challenge, uh, Don Mariano uh, offered or added commerce, siyempre, he had units in Mercantil, remember? So he added commerce, bookkeeping, and accounting, um, and the uh, ceramics, yan, in its curriculum. And uh, at that time, take note that uh, they decided to relocate again. Okay, so these relocations to improve the the instruction and the well-being of the students. Yan. Kaya makikita nyo, no, as year goes by, talagang ang tiyaga ni founder maghanap ng lugar. Kasi noon, unti pa lang kasi ang tao din noon, ang mga naninirahan. So, medyo madali pa maghanap ng lugar noon. Okay, so, and then eight years later, a third floor was added uh, housing 18 more classrooms to accommodate more students up until 1921. No? So, kumbaga unti-unti, hindi niya binibigla yung pagdadagdag. No? Kasi makikita niya, napapakiramdaman nila how important or uh, yung the need, no? the need of adding students or of classrooms because of the gradual increase of student enrollment. Okay, so talagang ano, uh, and uh, if you, if we, uh, hopefully, we could, uh, hopefully in the next webinars, uh, it will be shown that most of the students at that time enrolling in you came from the provinces. Kasi ito yung mga tao noon, yung mga hindi kaya, yung mga siyempre may hirap sila, at uh, ang gusto talaga nila is makapag-aral, makatungtong sa Maynila. Kasi, ah, uh, for a person coming from the province, one of the best investments that they could have is an education in in Manila. Na madadala nila sa kanilang probinsya, and later on, uh, they would be it would able to to uh, kung ma ma sila from poverty. That's the important uh, thing. That's the principle that they most of these students follow. Uh, next. Yeah, so again, so it stayed there in, until 1925 when the founder bought a parcel of land in uh, on Calle Lipa. So yung Calle Lipa, yan yung M. Foxon. Okay, so by 1913, it officially allowed, was officially allowed to confer high school diplomas to its graduates. So una from elementary, sabi nga natin, it's gradual. And from at first, it had uh, bilingual instruction, English and Spanish. And then two years after, it adopted English as its primary medium of instruction. Kasi nga, nung una, ang hirap na biglang English kagad. Kasi ang language talaga noon is either Spanish or in Tagalog. So what happened was, you know, Spanish, no? so from traditional to transitional, 
to transformational uh, instruction. No? So, and then, yeah, June 1915, in cooperation with Ricardo Laxon, the Laxon brothers, uh, they opened the College of Law, accredited on February 7, 1916, which was the Philippine Law School. Kasi at that time, uh, Ricardo Laxon entered NU as uh, as its uh, as an official. So, so he owned Philippine Law School, so nagkaroon sila ng na agreement ni founder na magkaroon tayo ng law school. Kasi at that time, uh, marami ng competitions nun eh, sa law eh. Siyempre, nandiyan ang UST, ang UP. So, siyempre, ang, yan, yung sa Kule Mercantil, no? So, it was the, the next uh, addition. Next. Yeah, so, here are the pictures of, uh, yan, of the, the students at that time at Colegio Mercantil when they celebrated its 11th founding anniversary. Okay. Next. Yeah, so here, National Academy, 1919 to 1920. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, yeah, medyo nagkaroon ng typo. It should be 1916. Ano? So, 1916, uh, National Academy. So, Kasi it offered this time the College of Liberal Arts. So they gradually offered baccalaureate courses. Um, so accredited on February 15, 1918. So they started offering um, courses, so baccalaureate courses and associate courses or degree programs. No? So preparatory law. So pag natapos na yung preparatory law ng first and second year, you can already take up law school. Yan. The same with medicine, first and second year, parang pre-med at pre-law, no? so leading to the title of uh, Associate in Arts. And we also have the Liberal Arts course, yan, yung talaga degree of Bachelor of Arts. Okay, so kasi noon konti pa lang, eh. unlike uh, today na yung mga baccalaureate degrees is already four years. So noon, two years pa lang noon. Then later on, it was reincorporated on January 17, National Academy. 1921, which changed its name to National University. Yeah, so that's, that was a picture of uh, of the National Academy at uh, at that time. So, nasa ano na siya? Nasa Kali Lipa. Okay, next. Yeah, so, during the time in National Academy, uh, they already have different uh, clubs and fraternities. So, first, yan, kasi uh, you have the day department and the high department. So, like in elementary, no, yung yan, Mabini Debating Club. Ano? Can you imagine that? You have the orchestra, the women's league, because uh, at, that, at, at that time, the, the, the feminist movement was very strong. Okay, the yan, National Academy Athletics Association. So, even before you have the UAAP, they already had their own athletic club. Then uh, the high department, I think this is with high school, you have uh, the mercantile debating club, or you have uh, you know, yung dramatics club. Okay, and you, can you imagine you have a junior Philippine Senate at that time because uh, they, for those who want to practice, who want to enter law, no? who want to practice lawmaking, they already have all these uh, practices. So extracurricular activities was already evident at that time. So, next, <clears throat> yeah, the student publication, so we have uh, the Academy, so the Academy Herald or simply the Herald was published monthly except uh, April and May. So, uh, in the Herald, it published all the important news and events all around National Academy. And uh, when it evolved to NU by 1921, it evolved as the National so it became the official school paper of uh, of NU at that time. So can you imagine how how strong it was? Ano? the uh, the so the the stud the ideas of the students were published in the in the Herald at that time. Hopefully we we could have a copy of that. No? Yeah. Next. Hmm. And then uh, campus operation, of course, uh, during that time, uh, 
since uh, they offered scholarship to students, so every offices at that time, it became a university policy to have a student assistant in every office. No? So un up until today, no? so they provided opportunities for, for the poor and capable students to go to college. And uh, of course, there are conditions. Yan. So since their allowance, can you imagine, ano, 30 to 60 pesos a month, depending on the office that uh, they are serving. Kasi, kumbaga, even before AMA and STI implemented the, employ the enrollment to employment system, we are already implementing it at that time. Imagine that. Ano? So scholarships are given to the serving students. So you have the criteria. 15 units, uh, average not less than 2, and no grade lower than C. So that was the equivalent uh, grade uh, at that time. Okay, so you have the uh, yan, yung A, 8 minus, then B plus. So you have the numeric equivalent of 1 as the highest. Okay, so mostly in the report cards at that time, siyempre handwritten po, yun yung mga madalas uh, makita. Okay, so most of those things are are being seen in the in the in the card in the grade uh, in the scholastic records of uh, the students. Okay, so next. Yeah. So to sum up, because uh, my coverage was just uh, in the pre um, the pre university years of NU. So uh, from 1900 to 1921. These were the milestones that NU had. First, it was the first non-sectarian university in the Philippines from August 1, established in August 1, 1900, and thus the first non-sectarian private school to hire American teachers. Because uh, the American, uh, the law school dean was an American, and also the first private university to use English as the medium of instruction. So later on, other universities followed suit at the curriculum also of NU. So even though, um, you know, so at 120 years, we really have, we set milestones, we set standards that, uh, that every nationalian should be very proud of, especially at the legacy of our founder. And with that, uh, we have the, um, so actually this ends uh, my presentation. So for the, uh, for the references, next. Yeah, so here are the uh, references of uh, the presentation. So there are actually other ones, but uh, um, these are the most important things or that gave impact to NU's history, especially in the context of uh, its uh, the legacy of uh, of Mariano Hoxson. So with that, uh, I hope everyone is able to learn a lot from uh, Enius undying and enduring legacy and heritage. Thank you very much.